Patrick, do you know how many times you died in the X-Men series of those eight appearances? Do you know how many times Charles died? No. Four. That is a horrible ratio. You died 50% of the movies you appeared in. I don't know what that, what does that say, Patrick? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but uh, I do now have every confidence that uh, he's still around. Prepare your ears, humans. Happy, Sad, Confused begins now. I'm Josh Horowitz, and today on Happy, Sad, Confused, I don't know how this happened, but I'm clearly doing something right. Patrick Stewart is on the show for the fourth time. He has lived a remarkable life on the stage and, of course, in the X-Men and Star Trek series. He chronicles it all in a fantastic new memoir, Making It So. I am so thrilled to welcome back to Happy, Sad, Confused, Patrick Stewart, sir. Welcome. Thank you, Josh. I'm very happy to be back. Um, when we last spoke, it was a little bit of a different atmosphere. It was the chaos of you and your next generation friends, your Star Trek Picard friends on a live stage. Uh, I would imagine that is a that always devolves into chaos, glorious, wonderful chaos when you when you all gather together. Yes. Well, it could be damaging chaos <laughs> if they were not such a smart, likable, and and very committed group of people. I learned so much from them from season one when I wasn't altogether what I should have been. And um, but they supported me and advised me and gave me tips. And uh, I have been grateful to them for the rest of my life because the 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 attraction that Next Generation had for so many, many hundreds of thousands, probably millions of people is largely due to the ensemble feeling that I think made that series special. Indeed, indeed. And I know you've gotten a chance to reunite with some along this press tour, Whoopi Goldberg, etc. Um, I want to talk uh, at length about this wonderful book. I have it here, uh, Making It So. It's a fantastic read, I was just telling you. Um, I, I have to imagine this has been a cathartic process in both the writing and the talking about what you've written. Has it been emotionally uh, rewarding in, in both phases of it, in, in the actual writing of it, but also in in sharing it with the world. Yes, certainly in the writing of it, Josh, um, because never having done anything like this before, I mean, 300 words for a forward or an introduction is probably the most I'd ever done. And I was concerned that I would bring a tonality to it that, well, I, I listened I read and, uh, and I didn't listen to audiobooks, but I did dip into a number of um, memoirs in the weeks preceding my beginning to write. And some of them were marvelously helpful, some of them very entertaining, and some were kind of mildly offensive, I found. And, and so I imagined that I was with a group of my dearest friends sitting around a nice fire in winter with a glass of wine in our hands and and just chatting. But only one person was chatting, that was me. And so that's the tonality that I was aiming for. And it seems to have worked. <clears throat> no, indeed. I was just telling you before we started, uh, in reading this, I couldn't help but hear that unique Patrick Stewart voice in my head. You were basically telling your story as only you can. Um, I'm curious, like prior to this, like you say, you didn't fancy yourself a writer, and I'm sure it's someone that's done so much Shakespeare and the specificity of Trek, like, you know, writing is king, the writer is king. You must have always felt that in your in your pursuits. Um, was it tough to kind of ex to accept that um, you could be the teller of your own story? Or was this the only way to, to do it? You didn't want to kind of like do an as told to. You wanted to kind of really, if you were going to commit, do it in this way. Yes, it, if those qualities exist in, in the book, then I wanted to bring them alive also in the audiobook version of it. And, and on the whole, people seem to have liked that. It's it, never having done anything like this before. I started just with thinking about my past 
That was all. Going for long walks and uh, in pleasant Southern California and um, remembering. And I was astonished at how quickly a multitude of doors and windows began to open for me. Um, things about my childhood I'd never reflected on before. Uh, my friends, uh, my relationship with my teachers, which was very significant for me in what was to come after. And um, it's it, it just built up this huge store of recollection. And I, the one thing I tried to be more than anything else was authentic yeah. and real and, and not trying to present how I hoped to be seen, but who I was and, uh, and therefore who I would be seen. And th that was my primary objective in, in the work that I did. And then one day I sat down in this chair in this very pleasant room and um, began typing. I have to say, I mean, the specificity of your memory, of your recollections is is startling to me. I do not possess this kind of memory. I mean, I feel like an architect could recreate your family home simply by your recollections like you 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 have and it and it just it it also permeates with such warmth and such sweetness the opening sections of the book despite you know as you've talked about and you know you talk about in the book your father being a difficult man and really a troubled man by and large your recollections of your childhood um are sweet are filled with love and joy did that surprise you did that was that always the case or did you kind of come to that with the passage of time, this kind of um, perspective on your childhood? Oh, yes, Josh. <clears throat> the passage of time was very, very significant, which is why the longer that I reflected on my life, not just my childhood, but but even you know, into, into the sec second half of my career that I never expected to be where it is now. And it... It gave me um, more courage than I thought I had to speak frankly and honestly about um, my family, my home life, my friends, my teachers, my acting advisors, the directors that I worked with, all of whom made contributions, because I think many of them realized that in most respects, although people have told me that one of the things about my work that was always interesting was that it was intriguing. It was, there was a sort of contradiction about it. Um, you know, how come with no education, no social background, no comfortable home to invite all your friends into, could all these other things have come about? So I had plenty to think about, and no, no, I was no no yeah. running toilet. Let it, let let us say too no no. <laughs> I, I mean, this struck a nerve with me. I mean, you know, you have some years on me, but I I I I still was startled by that fact. That is, we had, <laughs> I don't know. We had no bathroom and no toilet, except what was called the, the outside one, and there was uh, a block of a red brick block with dustbins in the middle of it and two bathrooms, at, at two, no, not bathrooms, toilets at either end. There was no electricity, no power in those rooms. So in winter, this also, what, each one of these little brick rooms became my study, became what is now a little more comfortable here. And I... Um, I I began to sense that if I kept my head there in that place, then enough information would crawl or hurtle its way into my composing something about my life. But it was very, very basic. And I know there are a number of people who I think have been a little bit suspicious about how I created my early childhood and the conditions under which I lived with my 
elder brother <clears throat> and my mother because my father was away in the war. I was born in July 1940. And I've done the calculations very carefully. And I believe that it's more than possible that I was conceived the night before my father went to war in uh, October of 1939. And of course, although he came home on leave once, so I was told, and there is a photograph of him holding the baby Patrick in his arms. I didn't really get to know him until the end of the war in 1945, right. when he was demobbed and uh, came home. And um, that's where the problem starts. <laughs> yes. And, 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 you know, you've been very open about this and kind of like, you know, it, it's important to be open, I think, about these kind of topics. This is a man who suffered from what we would now call PTSD and obviously had uh, had severe repercussions from that. And unfortunately, they took out on your 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 wonderful mother. Um, when you think back to your dad now, is it is it with a smile? Is it with sadness? What are the overriding emotions when you think about your father? Well, smiling and sadness can go hand in hand. Sure. And um, I I don't feel the rage, the fury, the fear that I experienced as a child. Um, instead, I see my father now in the context of what I learned about his military career, um, because I know quite a lot about it and have even talked with people who knew him when he was a soldier and uh, how he felt about that and how he felt about coming home and finding his life being transformed from regimental sergeant major of the parachute regiment. He was the most senior non-commissioned officer in the entire regiment, a regimental sergeant major. And he came home to laboring in mills or factories. And I think that was a battle for him to try to come to terms with what his real life was like, because you cannot claim, I think, that soldiering can be said to be a real life, uh, certainly not an ordinary life. Um, it's far, far from it. And um, he, he was deeply troubled. I, it was while standing on a spot in um, Western France that um, a historian said to me, I can tell you with absolute certainty that where you're standing now, your father stood in 1939 and maybe the beginning of 1940, before Dunkirk actually happened. My father was caught up in that invasion by the, uh, the British expeditionary forces, but it was a failure and everyone was on the run, those who could run and those who had somewhere to run to. So I, my father didn't actually see Dover. He had passed through Dover once before, but he was in um, a harbor town south uh, of, um, of Dover, and uh, it, it, he was the on the last ship that left. And when his ship sailed out of the harbor, the Nazis, the Nazi soldiers, were already in the outskirts of the city. So he was a very, very lucky man in that respect. And I know he knew that he was lucky, but still, his disappointments as to how his life eventually became after the I think I think he loved being a soldier right and he embraced authority and <laughs> and when it came to playing Jean-Luc Picard I had him to access because uh, oh yes I played kings and princes and prime ministers and yet when um I came to put my hands on the first script of Star Trek The Next Generation. It was none of those earlier experiences um, of what I 
no, no, my father had, but it opened, as I've said already, it opened little doors and windows and gave me insights of, at an, as an adult, of how my life had been as a child. Well, and I would imagine, um, you know, accessing anger and rage that, that festered in your father. I mean, I think, think too, and it's, I hope it doesn't trivialize it to kind of equate it to a moment in a Star Trek film, but I think about like Star Trek First Contact, one of my favorite scenes that you talk about um, with lightness, but it's a serious scene and it's an amazing moment where you kind of explode that famous explosion, um, you know, the line must be drawn here uh, and with respects to the Borg. Um, I mean, that comes from somewhere. That's, that's, uh, that's deep. Yeah. That's my father. Yeah. <laughs> You um, a few years ago, you sadly uh, lost. I know your your older brother Trevor, and I would imagine there's got to be some poignancy in the course of writing this. I don't know if he passed while you were working on this, but to know that you that that nuclear family, you're you you are the remaining representative of that family now. So it is on you to immortalize, and you have, in fact, it's a great tribute. You've immortalized your family forever, for all time. Um. Did that, does that kind of weigh on you? I mean, you could see it as kind of a, a privilege and honor to like, you know, carry on your family name in, in, in the form of this wonderful book. Yes. The only little stir of sadness in me about this is that none of them were here to know that or to hold the book in their hands. Right. Um, nobody in my family, as far as I'm aware, had ever written like that. And I am now the um, the oldest member of my family, of my generation of family anyway. Um, my brother Trevor, who indeed, uh, he passed away when I was um, in the second year of writing. And... Uh, it it was uh, a pain and uh, a profound regret and sadness that I I was unready for, yeah. and yet it overwhelmed me at the time. And it wasn't because oh Lord I didn't have a senior member of the family I could now turn to and ask for advice. Now they were turning to me and asking for my advice, right. um, and that has been challenging. It is a book and a memoir about family. It is also about a love of the arts and particular theater. Theater uh, just permeates your life. It always has. It always will. You talk at length about, I mean, there are, you know, huge sections about, you know, repertoire, you know, um, um, you know, uh, traveling theater, uh, um, uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company, your aspirations early on. And your aspirations, correct me if I'm wrong, they, film and TV wasn't even on the radar. You were happy. You would have been thrilled and happy. The Royal Shakespeare Company was the end-all, be-all for you growing up, I take it. Oh, yes. Entirely so. Um, it's not that I didn't have an attraction for film. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I hadn't had much opportunity to have attraction for television because even from later days, we never had a television set in our right. house. Right. We had a radio. And it was on all the time. And that's what my father listened to. And that's why, because we only had, um, as you are aware, because it's right at the start of the book, we lived in what was known as a one up, one down. A house in a small row of houses that only had one living room on the ground floor and one bedroom upstairs with a stone staircase that connected the ground floor to the first floor. Second floor. This is where I get confused sometimes <laughs> living in America. The, the, the terminology, I can't remember exactly. All right, the first floor. But, yeah, yeah, that always trips me up when I visit yeah. Europe as well. I understand <laughs> it, sir. <laughs> but um, what I was happiest to do with the book was to write about and thank and detailed 
the care that was given to me by people who were not in my family. Um, my teachers, my first acting teacher that I had, the local county council where I grew up in the West Riding of Yorkshire, um, they gave me a grant to go to drama school because when the Bristol Big Theatre School accepted me, and it was, they, they did it all in the same meeting. I went down to Bristol for an audition for the school and uh, I caught, caught an overnight train from the north of England. So I arrived in Bristol at about six o'clock in the morning, having had very little sleep and uh, found that the, the, the school in Clifton was only a long walk away from the railway station. So that's what I did. And I did my audition, <clears throat> and um, the uh, director of the school, Duncan Ross, said, all right, thanks, Patrick, we don't need any more from you. We'll see you in September. Just like that. And I was totally unprepared for it. So I went home and told my parents, and my mother was excited and proud for me. But my father said, well, who the bloody hell is going to pay for it, Patrick? Oh Lord, I'd never thought about that. Not for a moment had I thought about it. Because we had we had almost nothing. And um it was my acting coach, Ruth Winnowen, who with Cecil Dorman, my English teacher, um, are the two people to whom my, my book is dedicated. Uh, Ruth Winnowen and Cecil Dorman. And it was Ruth who said, Patrick, maybe you should apply to the county council for a grant, because I did know that my county council supported amateur theatricals. And they were very proud of the, the, the level of ability that, that those groups had. And um, I, I, I still felt because <clears throat> I didn't go to grammar school. I wasn't academic. I had, um, I'd been to what was called a secondary modern school, which meant that basically the, the teaching prepared you to work in a mill or a factory or, oh, my Lord, in the coal mines. Uh, my, my town was quite a big coal mining town. And my father had worked as a, a young coal miner when he was 14. Um, but his mother mother pulled him out. You see, I nearly said mother. It's when I start talking about my background that it just comes forward. And there I am, um, you know, yeah. giving the game away. Um, but it... So um, I, I did. I made an application to my county council for um, a grant for higher education. And when I met with them, it was eight men in suits sitting behind a, a curving table. And each one of them had one question. And whether they'd agreed this in advance, I never found out. But um, the very last person to speak, who I think was the chairman of the group, said, now, just a minute, Patrick, tell us. Supposing we give you this money, and it's going to have to be a lot to pay for your education and your clothing and your your living allowance. I mean, what are we going to get out of that? <laughs> I mean, what, what good is it going to do us? <laughs> Typical Yorkshire comments. Um, you know, there's a wonderful Yorkshire saying that I've always enjoyed. You can always tell a Yorkshireman, but you can't tell him much. <laughs> <laughs> it's all there. And, uh, so um, I, I told them, I said, but my my intention is, and there was a certain amount of bullshit in this, you must understand, is that when I have got my education and I've got a, a, a degree or whatever it is they're going to give me, I will then be able to return to the north of England and give all of that that I've learned to those people who were like myself. Um, and in fact, that's pretty much what happened because my first job just as an actor was in Sheffield. And so I felt that I kept that side of the bargain. 
I, I also <clears> have <throat> to say I I love all the backstage stories throughout this um, and the kind of the demystification of the, of the art of acting and talking about some of these luminaries, you know, whether it's, you know, meeting Rod Steiger or Vivian Lee, or I love the story and I found so telling and revealing of Ian Holm. I believe it was Iceman Cometh you were in a production with and Ian Holm, one of the greats, right? One of the greats of all time. And who was apparently fantastic, nailing it. I believe playing Hickey probably right in, in the rehearsals and then it just it slipped away. And, and I'm curious, like for you, does that is that what acting is to you? Is it is it that ephemeral? Is it like you you're kind of like on a knife's edge at all times, like between greatness and just collapsing? I, I'm not sure that it's correct to say always on this cusp, um, but it is true that. I experienced, and I know a lot of my colleagues did, certainly of my generation, if something good happened to them, that might be for the last time. Being cast in a role, having right. a success in a good role, um, being in a production that went on tour or, or uh, transferred from, you know, Brooklyn to Broadway or uh, North London to the National Theatre. Um, I always had that uncomfortable feeling of there's no guarantee right. that this is going to continue. And sometimes people reinforce that. When I was offered Next Generation and, um, and I learned that if I signed the contract it would be for a minimum of six years, which I was totally unknowing about and was astonished. But I was told by so many people, don't worry about that. That's not going to be a problem. You'll be lucky to make it through season one. Not just you, but you cannot revive an iconic series like Star Trek. You just can't. So don't worry about that. Come and do half a first season, make some money for the first time in your life and go home. Well, it didn't quite turn out like that. And, and infamously, no less than the great Serene McKellen told you this was a bad idea. Did 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 you lose the respect of any of your peers by accepting this? Like, did they shake their head at like Patrick selling out for for Hollywood at the time, or or were they understanding? I mean, you have to make a living. I mean, it's a job at the end of the oh, day. Oh yes, sure. But Ian knew what other projects were in line for me. And there were two very important theater projects. And, and Ian said, look, the chance of shooting a television series is always going to be there. In fact, it's going to grow and grow and grow. But what you're being offered in terms of the plays, that's, that's a rarity. And if you don't seize that, it may never come again. I mean, Ian has become a very beloved friend to my wife and myself. He actually married us. I mean, he performed the ceremony and um, his, he has played a vital role in my life and career. Um, and he himself has admitted he was wrong in his <laughs> advice. And, and uh, he, he, I've heard him tell that particular anecdote about he said, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, but there we are. But it's it is also lovely that even in the course of Trek, you know, you kept returning to the theater. And I, I've told you this before, but I'll say it again. You know, as a young man, uh, I of course love Next Generation and loved your performance. And it in no smart, in no small way, got me to the theater to see you do a Christmas Carol when it was in on Broadway here in New York. And of course, that led to a lifelong love of theater for me. That was a gateway for me. So I mean that. Well, certainly. And I'm and I'm sure I am not alone, sir. I mean, was that was that was that experience, was that need to kind of keep returning to the theater throughout Trek, what kind of kept you while you were while you increasingly, I think, accepted and enjoyed Trek for what it was as the years passed, um theater was was that keeping you kind of nimble and keeping you you engaged throughout those years? Yes, I think it was. Um 
I, I had a great respect, which came from my father and my mother, <clears throat> for work. Yeah. And the work and how you did it would be a, a, a vivid and accurate illustration of who you were. And so I took that very seriously. And I think it helped me through the first season of Star Trek because it was challenging. Yeah. I I was so unfamiliar with cameras and the the practical uh, means of making a television episode or a, se a season. Um, I was having to learn all the time. But I'm glad about that because the lesson about learning has never gone away. And I, I am watching uh, I, the last, like, I guess, Many of us, I've been watching a lot of television in the last three years. Yep. And um, I, I have sensed in the last five or six years, changes in technique and approach, particularly by younger actors and actresses in how they do their work. And I am, I am drawn to it because it's not how I had viewed up my work in the past. Although, um, I mean, there is an anecdote I tell in the book. When uh, my first day in front of a film camera, I actually spent the morning, it was only half a day, actually, it wasn't even a whole day, um, in a scene with Rod Steiger, sitting in the back of a car where I pulled a gun on him. Now, if, if you have any recollection of a film called... Um, on the Waterfront, of course. On the waterfront, water. of course. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Rod Seiger had been one of my. When I when I first was exposed to on the waterfront and that kind of acting on camera, I was hooked. It it just riveted me, and I tried to see all the work that those actors did. But um, uh, on that day. Um, I was invited to uh, to have lunch and with him. And um, he said to me, Patrick, there's one very important thing that I really think you should hold on to. A camera photographs thoughts. I had never for a moment given it any consideration. Acting wasn't about thinking. It was about doing and being, you know and raising your voice like I have just been doing now. <laughs> and uh, it, but it it became my pursuit to study that and to, and to simply let my head come out in front of the camera and all my feelings. And that is happening to such an extraordinary degree with young actors these days. That I and I haven't actually done any television work now for two years, and I'm hungry to start experimenting again. The last TV work, of course, was the third season of Star Trek Picard, which was just extraordinary in so many respects and i think trek fans were almost shocked at just like the degree of of, of how satisfying it was and uh, you know i'm still bummed that it didn't get maybe the awards attention maybe that stigma still exists in the sci-fi space but it is what it is um you said though that you still have an appetite potentially for more picard but what are the parameters this time because i know you had specific parameters when they first came to you on star trek picard now is it you want to do a film, yes? You don't want to, not a series? Yes. It... Um, after we finish recording our seven seasons of Next Generation, we made four movies, one after the other, Star Trek movies, of varying qualities. The best one being the one directed by Jonathan Frakes, who contact, did course, a yeah. wonderful job and yeah. was one of the people who had the most influence on me on the show um, because of his experience and his uh, understanding of the complexities and how bringing 
different qualities on to the stage floor was very, very important and diversity, you know, and change. Um, so it's it's an ongoing procedure for me. And I'm I am I heard only last night about a script that is being written, but written specifically with the actor Patrick to play in it. And um I've been told to expect to receive it within a week or so. And uh, I'm so excited because it sounds like the kind of project where the experimentation that uh, I want to do will be essential for this kind of material. So something... So it's, it's good that at 83... Yeah, I, still learning I'm new tricks. Out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. But it sounds like a, a little bit of a different take than what we've seen the last few seasons of Star Trek Picard. What you're, I know you haven't read it yet, but something a little mm -hmm. different. Yeah. I, I mean, what was so interesting about Picard and the main reason why I decided to commit to three seasons of it was that um, uh, Akiva Goldsman and uh, it talked to me about the changes that had happened in my life in the last 20 years. And he said, were there any? And I, of course, said, yes, lots and lots. And, and new journeys and new experiences and relationships. And he said, exactly. Well, that has also been Jean-Luc's experience. He's not the same man. He's no longer captain of the Enterprise. He was made an admiral. It became really desk work, which is not what he ever wanted to do. And now he's back at home, living on his vineyard and uh, and seeming to be reasonably content. All that was an act. All that was Jean-Luc trying to pretend, as I think my father did, that everything was all right. Right. But it wasn't. Right. And so the, particularly the last season of Picard was extraordinary to perform because I was continually being faced because of the wonderful job the writers did with a, a different man. I mean, there, 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 were, there was one wonderful moment I really enjoyed researching when Picard literally didn't know what to do, how, how to deal with this situation. He, he 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 was stunned by it and 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 watching him having to cope with that realization of i i'm old and and i can't work out how to deal with this you know it was it was a fascinating process so i i enjoyed that uh i also of course want to mention um your wonderful tenure in the X-Men franchise, eight appearances, I believe, as Professor X, Charles Xavier. Patrick, do you know how many times you died in the X-Men series of those eight appearances? Do you know how many times Charles died? No. Four. That is a horrible ratio. You died 50% of the movies you appeared in. <laughs> I don't know what that, what does that say, Patrick? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but uh, I do now have every confidence that uh, he's still around. <laughs> On the X-Men front, I would be shocked if your buddy, Hugh Jackman, who is returning in Deadpool 3, one of his first phone calls was not to you, Patrick. I'm going to guess I might see Patrick Stewart in a, in a Deadpool Wolverine movie. It, it, it has come up. Um, there's been a process, but, you know, the last two, three years have been... So difficult with yeah. both the, the labor problems and the health problems and COVID, yeah. you know. There's nothing sentimental about the way they dispatched you in the Doctor Strange movie. Do you? I've talked to a lot of the actors that were doing the Multiverse of Madness movie. That that, that was a very interesting production. I'm just curious, like, do you, were you alone? Like, were you with the other actors? Do you remember, like, the circumstances of that? I was alone. You were alone. That's what I thought. <laughs> The magic of movie making. I think I think the the big scene um, 
I think each one of the leading actors had the same experience. They were shot on their own. Yeah, that's that's so what I've heard. Frustrating and disappointing. But well, that's, again. Yeah, that's how it has been. The last few years have been challenging. Right. And you do say in the book that your time on stage is not done. Is, is there a specific aspiration? Do you still feel that way? I mean, that takes a lot out of a man, a 47-year-old man or whatever. Yeah, I, I do. Um, it was my first love. I would like to find an appropriate way of saying thank you and goodbye to it. And there, there are some ideas that I've got. Um, the, the main issue with all of this is stamina. Yeah. Because um, I, I think a lot of film actors would be irritated by, by saying this, but three hours on a stage or even two hours on a stage are the equivalent of a 12 or 14 hours in front of a camera. Um, and the requirements to make that work, to make it live real and spontaneous um, is, is so important. So um, yes, I would, I would like us to have one last shot at a Picard movie, or rather, no, it wouldn't be a Picard movie. It would be a Star Trek movie, okay. but it would have the Picard cast as we saw them in Picard because everyone was so different. I mean, Michael Dorn, you know, know. in his appearance. The silver hair, the whole thing, yeah, yes. pacifist. And his quiet, gentle manner. Yes. And because he changed, he learned different things about life. And I, I have great, great respect for Michael. What he did, well, all of my colleagues on that show, but Michael in particular took a giant step into the future with the, the performance that he gave. Um, and so, you know, the, I mean, the one play that comes up repeatedly is King Lear. I, I was in it once, but I played a supporting role, and that was many decades ago. Um, and, of course, Shakespeare was always my primary obsession and love. Um, and, you know, I, I, I walk every day, I get exercise. And I'm no longer in control of the Shakespeare that floats into my head, which is why I don't like having to walk with someone because they chatter and I don't want, I just want my head to drift and, you know, <laughs> pick up the rhythm at which I'm walking. And <laughs> I know that will sound Silly and no, no, you have you have a jukebox of uh, of Shakespeare in your head. That's quite a, a, a testament to the work you put in over the years, sir. It's amazing. Uh, um, well, we'll see. Yeah. Um, uh, there's one director I would like. Well, there are two actually, but one first choice I would like to do the work with, and and it, it will need to be a collaboration and one that will have to keep in mind my stamina sure. so that you know i can finish the job as well as start it well i hope uh i hope if that does indeed come to pass it comes to new york i'll be there as i was at a christmas carol at every stage in your career um truly congratulations on this i'll remind the audience again uh making it so um you know we all just heard a sample like a tiny fraction of the wonderful stories of this gentleman's life um you've contributed so much to the arts, to people like me, helping inspire us uh, for our love of theater and film and TV. Um, it's always a privilege, sir. Thank you so much for the time, truly. Josh, thank you. That means a great deal to me. And I have very much enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. And so ends another edition of Happy, Sad, Confused. Remember to review, rate, and subscribe to this show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm a big podcast person. I'm Daisy Ridley, and I definitely wasn't pressured to do this by Josh. <laughs>